Welcome to Village Church. We're committed to seeing people transformed into fully devoted followers of Jesus. We do this through focusing on gospel, community, and culture. Learn more about us at thisisvillagechurch.com. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. How are you this morning? I'm so glad to see you. My name's Chris. For those of you who are online and not in person, we're happy you're with us too. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are going through a piece of text today in John chapter 20. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. That is like the pinnacle of the Christian faith. This is party time. This is the big news, the excitement. This is the moment we yell, he is risen! You have not expected Easter Sunday today, did you? But that's exactly, exactly what this is. And it is so cool because I'm just going to start you off right in the first line of text because it's the basis of which we should function from. The idea of the resurrection of Jesus empowers everything else that we've heard throughout the testimonies of Scripture. All the stories, all the ideas, all the themes, all the well wishes, everything that is prayed for for the future of the church, all the things that are seen in the history of God's people. And his redemptive story unfolds in a pinnacle moment moment that we're looking at today. And in chapter 20, verse 1, it says this, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now on the first day, let's start there, because this first day of the week should be the foundation by which we set our hearts for the remainder of the week. I don't know how your week was, but I can tell you that today is a day of hope. This is a day of first things, a day that you can set your heart and your mind and your soul and all of the things you have in your heart, your anticipations upon the good news of Jesus that was disrupting to Mary here, but can be hope for you today. My question is, do you need Sunday? Do you need today, the first day of your week to be a good day? Yes, me too. I'll tell you why. Because in the last week and a half, three crazy things have happened. There was a bomb threat at my kids' school, blew their little hearts up in a scary way where I had to work with them and counsel them through little things. Second, my car got impounded. I'll tell you about that story later. And third, our kitchen caught fire last night. So here I am spending the whole night cleaning up fire extinguisher dust everywhere. Things are okay. Thank you for your concern. But man, uh, what a week. I, I need to sometimes take a pause. Because if I was to allow myself to get wrapped up in all the nonsense of the past, I can have a hard time moving forward. And maybe you're like me. Maybe you're like me where your head just gets caught up in everything that's happened before. And today we come with the good news of resurrection saying there is new life. There's a new foundation of which you can set your mind to. Maybe you for your whole life have actually already and still been living a life apart from the truth of Jesus. And maybe today is going to be a first day kind of day for you. It's going to be a new day for you, a day filled with hope, a day filled with purpose, a day that resets your heart and your mind onto the possibilities of what it means to have a clarity, like we're going to see in this passage, that can change you, not just for a moment, but can be something that changes you over and over and over and over again. This is why even you, uh, us as pastors or people who might be spiritual mentors or authorities in your life would actually encourage you to even start your day with the reminder of the gospel and the good news of Jesus, the hope that he brings into your world, because otherwise you're going to have everything else rushing you, all the worries about what could have been, all the worries about what should be, all the things that might happen, and all these longings and desires, they rush you first. But if you put the good news of Jesus before yourself and let your heart and mind be set upon his resurrection and his power and his truth and his great love for you and his desire to give you a greater experience of life through his presence in your life, Not all the stuff you might want, but more of him. Man, that's going to change your world. And it changes Mary's too and the disciples. So she came to the tomb early and while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. This was this moment that she goes into this tomb where Jesus has been laid. Let me catch you up on the story. This man, Jesus, he was born a virgin birth. His mom was like, he was conceived by the spirit of God into his mother. She 
kept him and nurtured him and made him for 40 weeks as he was made and then brought into the world. Then he lived this perfect life. And at the age of 30, we start to really see his ministry unfold. This is when he has these moments with his disciples and with people. And this man is just not like a normal man. He actually is claiming to be the son of God and has power like you could not believe. Power to actually raise people from the dead. Power to heal the sick. Power to forgive sins and has different perspectives on the kingdom of God that other people just don't have. It's just incredible. But this man started to be hated by the religious leaders and authorities of the time. People actually turned on him to the point that they convicted him before the, 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 the spiritual elites, but then also before the governors. And then he was taken and crucified, beaten and murdered. He hung on a cross and truly did physically, literally in every way die. It was not a swooning. It was a full death where he was put into the grave. He was wrapped in linen cloths and spices, about 75 to 100 pounds worth, and buried in a tomb that was not yet used the tomb of a rich man who opened this tomb for Jesus and rolled a hard stone in front, now guarded by Roman guard. And this is the moment of which Mary is supposed to come, expecting it to be one way and finding out that it's not, that the stone yet had been rolled away. Now, I and my experience as a pastor have done a lot of funerals. Um, and you always expect certain things from them. But sometimes even burials or funeral services or moments that you're, you're, you're thinking about and pondering on and, and mourning someone who's been lost can, can be a little bit wild. Even my dad's, when my dad passed away, he never wanted to be buried. He wanted to be cremated and then spread in one of his favorite places, which was the Dominican Republic. Okay? Yeah, okay, Dad, we can do that for you, right? So after he passed away, um, we did, we cremated him, and we put, we had him, his, what was left of him, his ashes in a bag, which my mom took in her carry-on. I'm surprised she didn't get it tested for, like, cocaine or something, but she made it through. Um, and then we ended up in the Dominican Republic at this all-inclusive that my dad just loved. And so, like, my mom paid for this trip for our whole family, and we went down, and one of the days we were going to spread his ashes. And so we take the, the ashes with us, and we get this catamaran, um, and we're on the back of this boat out in the middle of the ocean and, and we decide we're going to sit off the back and have this beautiful moment of goodbye and spread his ashes out the back of the boat. Now my kids are there, my wife, my siblings, their extended, their families, um, and we're all there and my mom plays one of my dad's favorite songs, that Ren Collective song, My Lighthouse, My Lighthouse, my, right, and this beautiful moment's coming, here it is, this is the moment, we're going to say goodbye to dad. And so my mom starts shaking the bag of ashes out, but my brother, as she starts, he's like, maybe we should slow the boat down because um, the wind is just getting a little bit crazy. And so she pours the ashes and like a cloud of glory, poof, my dad's everywhere. Like all over us, in my mouth. I'm like, ugh, ugh, dad, ugh. Like I can't, like my mom thought she had, had passed the moments where my dad would be all over her. But once again, he is just covering her from head to toe. It's this crazy, wild moment. Like not what we anticipated to say goodbye to my dad, all right? And I thought that was wild. But then you read Mary's account where she's like, the stone, she walks up and sees the stone, and the stone's actually taken away from the tomb. So she's thinking, what do I do at this point? And ran back to the disciples, to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, which is really interesting that John might say this, because we're going to start to get to know John a little bit more in this text of how he speaks to himself, how he describes himself, and see that um, he... He's a little arrogant, you know. He's, he's got a couple things in him that make him unique uh, to, 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 as a disciple, but also as he writes it down. And the cool thing is, as we read his words, we have to be reminded that this is like sacred text. This is inspired scripture. God kept these words in here. So it's very true that uh, Jesus loved John. And then said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So she comes to the tomb, and the first thing she sees is that she sees that the stone is rolled away, and she comes to a conclusion. She concludes that the body of Jesus has been taken away, that they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. Somebody has taken him. Now, in this time, the reason there was Roman guard at the tomb was because people would actually, like, grave rob and steal from the tombs of people and steal from their graves. And it became such a problem that it became a capital punishment situation. If you stole from the tomb, the conviction for that and the outcome, the sentence would be capital punishment. So people would normally steal from tombs. They'd steal trinkets and things that were gifted to the bodies, things that were of value. And so her mind is running to that and said, someone's taken the Lord out of the tomb. And that's where she stuck 
with how she saw him. And that might even be your skepticism today. If we talk about the resurrection of Jesus and we put point to the empty tomb as proof for that, you may believe, well, someone clearly just took it. Someone clearly just took the body and ran off with it, and that's the end of it. It's case solved, easy peasy, don't believe in Jesus. It's not true. It's not real. Mary's mind is in that place and says, we don't know where they've laid him. Where did Jesus go? And so Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. So they're making their way there, and both of them were running together. They're running towards Jesus, one with the other, going to see what has happened, and they're sprinting there, but... The other disciple outran Peter. Here we go again, John. This guy saying, man, of all the foot races to happen, this really important one where we're running to the empty tomb of Jesus, John was the faster one. Yeah. I outran the old man and got there first and reached the tomb first. This is so interesting, isn't it? Because it seems a little bit arrogant. It seems a little bit like fun, but also like it's inspired. Here's a principle you can take from something like John's words in Scripture, his account of this moment. It's okay to celebrate the achievements in your life. And I think it's important for us to say that. It's okay if you've done something and experienced something to actually celebrate the achievement in your life. It's okay to say, man, I am loved by Jesus and to feel some sort of value in that because Jesus has placed that on you. It's okay to say, man, I outrun the old man Peter and reach the tomb first and it's okay to celebrate that. But what is not okay is to be defined by your achievements. It's okay to say, hey, we're running together towards Jesus and where he is. It's okay to say, hey, I outran him. It's okay to celebrate your gifts. Some of us get caught in this weird place where we are unwilling to use the gifts God's given to us because we don't want to outshine or outrun or make somebody else feel small. And I'm saying this because I've experienced it as your pastor. People who hold back their gifts for the sake of Christ because they don't want to feel puffed up but it's okay to celebrate what's in you. Humility is not pretending like you don't have something, like you don't have the gifts. I think that actually cheapens the gifts that God's given you. One of the beautiful things about the place I am right now, I pastor a location called Langley South, and this is one of the first places in my experience, and, and I think it has to do with my maturity of who I see myself in, in, the, in who Jesus says I am, and understanding who I need to be in the midst of my growth. And, but it's brought me to a place in my life where I no longer feel like I have to prove myself and who I am. Do you ever feel like you have to do that? Do you ever feel like you have to prove how good you are, or prove that you can do something, or prove that you can, you can show up and be the person that you think people around you need you to be? Because I tell you, there's going to be so many times where you don't feel like that person. Just yesterday... Uh, my friend and I, we had set up a, a time to go and see a Winnipeg Jets versus a Vancouver Canucks hockey game. And we set this up months ago because I'm from Winnipeg, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bleed Winnipeg Jets, okay? My kids are from BC, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to let them love a couple BC teams. But my friend and I were going to go, and so we set this up, and so I'm dri- starting to drive downtown. I say goodbye to my wife and kids, and I, I, I head out. My son Beckham's sitting on the counter, drinking a glass of milk, and Beckham has this thing where literally, and I'm talking 100% of the time, if you give him a cup without a lid, that thing is going to spill. Like, I don't know how it happens every time, but I'm talking every single time. It's to the point that it's comical. You can just expect that at some point in this dinner, he's going to spill it. You start guessing when you have the towel ready. But he's sitting up on the counter drinking milk, and he spills his milk. Now, the way our stove is, our our oven, our oven is set into the countertop, so below it. So some milk spills down into the top of where the oven is. Not a lot, but so my wife, she wipes it all and cleans it all down. And then as they're having dinner in the other room, my wife starts hearing the oven start to beep. Beep, 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 beep. So she goes in there, same thing in R2D2, who's maybe in the kitchen, comes in, looks around the corner and sees the oven just beeping. She's like, okay, that's strange. And then it starts to smoke and smoke starts pouring out the top of the oven. And she's like, okay, that's really strange. And so she grabs the fire extinguisher and waits and looks at it. And then all of a sudden, it starts to, like, explode. Like, bluish electricity, flames start shooting out of it, start coming. My oldest son grabs my son Jacob and runs out the door with the other kids and sets them off, gets them to the, the neighbor's house. And Mercedes starts blasting this thing with the, with the fire extinguisher, right? 
it doesn't do anything. The flames just keep coming through, coming through. So she's like, okay, I gotta go. She grabs her purse, runs out the door. Doesn't know where her phone is, doesn't know, like no time to get anything. The flames are just shooting out of this thing. And so she calls me from the neighbor's house saying, there was a ton of fire in our kitchen when I left. I don't know what it's like. The firemen are inside the house right now. And here I am driving to Vancouver, excited to see a Winnipeg Jets game. Can you imagine that moment in your heart as far as like who I need to be? Like here I am being like, man, as a father, a husband, a protector, a, 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 all these things that I need to be, I'm just wearing already the guilt of not being the person I need to be in that moment because I wasn't present. What the goodness of Jesus does in your life is that he actually says, hey, I don't need you to be who you think you need to be. I just need you to be who I've made you to be and trust me with all the rest of the details of your life. So it's okay that John might say, man, I outran Peter and I reached the tomb first, that I can celebrate my accomplishments, but I can't let them be the major thing of who I am. Now, not only in practical ways, but also in spiritual ways. Let me just unpack this in a way of discipleship for your soul. As you follow Jesus... By God's grace, the Spirit of God, and this might be new for some of you who are new Christians, or if you've been thinking of becoming a Christian or following Jesus, this is part of the package, is that the Spirit of God is going to do things through the text of Scripture, through people around you, and through moments with Him that convict you to change your life. There will be things that He will ask you to do differently in your life because of the relationship you have with Him. Now let's consider this. Consider if Jesus has asked you to change something and you know exactly what it is. Maybe even in your own life right now, you can consider where he's asked you to make change, where he's empowering you and calling you to be different than you've been in the past. Now, what happens sometimes to people is they take that identity piece and they put it inside themselves and say, I am now made to be someone new, so I'm going to change this about myself. Whatever it could be. It could be things around anger and holding your tongue. It could be things about sexual ideas and lust you might have. It could be things about greed or gossip. It could be things about all sorts of things you have in your life. Gluttony and health. All of these things. I'm going to change it. And so what happens is you tend to start really well with a plan and accountability and, and movement and growth. And you build and build and build. And you can go a long season of good health. And you see this in people. Oh man, I've gone this long without engaging with that sin. Real change, what a joy, what a good thing, what an accomplishment. But what happens then is if someone then fails at that moment where they have this great thing and they put all their eggs in the, the basket of longevity and, and health before Jesus of what they've accomplished in that moment, is that sometimes what happens then is if they do fail, if they do stumble, if they fall back into that sin, if they fall back in, what happens is a lot of shame comes into their life. And they internalize the shame as a piece of their identity because their identity was built on something they could not stay, sustain alone. Do you see what I'm saying here? If you build yourself up on your accomplishments, even the spiritual ones of, man, I've been this far from this sin for this long, and then you fail, everything has been put in the wrong basket. It's been put on what you can do. Instead, allow it to roll into what Jesus has done. The same grace he gives you in that moment of actually forgiving you and calling you to a different lifestyle, he will continue to give you again and again and again as you are perfected into his image the time you're here and continuing to grow in his image and likeness. And that's so important because if you put it only in the things that you're outrunning, the only the things that you're accomplishing, the things that you're doing, then you're putting all, those, all that pressure and all that weight of Jesus Jesus' glory on yourself, and that's not where it's meant to be. It's not where it's meant to be. And we see this time and time again with people who just try so hard. Instead, let the glory go to Jesus so that even when you fail, you can thank him once again for the freedom he gives you from that sin too. Let's continue in the text. And stopping to look in, he saw the linens lying there, but did not go in. So this is John. At his first glance, he gets there before Simon, and he looks into the tomb, and he sees the linen cloths lying there. Not with, not with Jesus in them, but just lying there. Like, he doesn't go in further to investigate, but he sees physically what that is. And that's an important sign of what he saw. And then Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb. So if John got there first, Simon just went a little further just to prove himself. 
and he saw the linen cloths lying there. So they both saw the linen cloths lying there in the tomb, but these are different like verbiage and signs of seeing. It's actually in the real language, it's a lot different. This saw right here, the first saw we see is that John looked in and saw the physical layout of the tomb and where things were. He saw it. He just saw it. He didn't make conclusions about it. He didn't observe it. He just looked and witnessed and saw what was in there. Maybe this is you with Jesus right now. You're here right now, and all you do is you see. Like, you've been brought to church your whole life. You don't feel like you're really engaged with what's happening here, but you're here maybe because mom brought you, or you're dating someone who wishes you would follow Jesus, or you've been invited by a friend, or you think you might need to be part of something, and you're seeing life change around you and other people. You're seeing people preach and sing about the goodness of Jesus. You're seeing things, but it's just from a distance. Now, Peter comes and goes in further, and when he sees what he saw, this word actually doesn't just mean he physically sees what's in the tomb, but that he observes it, that he considers it, that there's something further in his mind and heart of what he's looking into. Rather than just seeing the physical outline of things, he starts to try and understand it a bit by really observing the scene. And the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. You can underline that. We're going to get back to that in a second. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first, thank you, John, also went in. And he saw and believed. Something completely different in this different happens in this third time that one of them looks at it. So at first, John just looks in and sees the physical outlay. Peter dives in and actually observes it. And John comes in, and he considers it to the point that it actually changes him, and he believes. Now, what is the truth of what John is believing in? Because this is the point of where everything comes to a, to, a, to a climax of what we can believe in the Christian faith. Remember, Mary's thoughts on the outcome of the empty tomb was what? That someone took the body. That, was that what John believed? Peter looked in and saw the linens and considered them. But John now believes something about the scene, and it's this. It's that John believed that the truth of who Jesus was was actually true. He believed that Jesus actually did raise from the dead. These linens, when you look at them, they weren't like torn apart. Like if you read the Lazarus story in John 11, when Lazarus is raised from the dead, it says he comes out bound by the linens. And Jesus says, hey, unbind him and let's go. Like there's a whole moment of his binding. This is not that. They don't walk into this whole like strip of linens being torn off a person or someone struggling. Like Jesus rose from the dead, did not need help to come out of the confines of death, rose, come, came back to life and actually truly lives to the point that he even folded up the face cloth that was on him. Like this is like, This is miraculous what he's seeing. He believed something different. He believed that the price of death was fully paid and Jesus was victorious over Satan, sin, and death. So he rose again, free from the binds of death. Without pressure, cause, or trouble, he just came back to life. That's what Jesus did. That is so powerful and so beautiful. Let's not miss that. Because if we don't believe that, then we're not going to get further in the text. We're not even going to understand what's truly happened. What John believes in this place is the truth that things are paid for and things that are paid for feel really good. And some of you here don't even know that God has paid for something in you that you cannot pay for yourself. For us to understand the good news of Jesus, we have to understand the brokenness of us. We truly do. We have to know that our sin causes separation between us and God, and some of us just don't know it. I was driving to a congregant's night house the other night, and as I'm driving, I come to a stoplight, and a text pops up. And I know I shouldn't look at it, but I do. And it asks me, snacks or dessert? And I'm about to answer this text, but the light goes green. I put my phone down, and as I start to drive, I hear this rip, rip behind me. Ooh. My glass is a little foggy, so I'm sure maybe whoever's behind me can't really see in. This is my very honest heart at this point. (laughs) I pull over to the side of the road, and the cop comes up to my window, and he says, do you know why I pulled you over? And like every good citizen, I say, no. (laughs) I have some ideas, but I'll let you tell me. (laughs) And so he says, your insurance is expired. I say, what? My insurance is expired? So what are you talking about? Like, I, I keep up on that stuff. Like, 
I'm trying to think back. I'm like, no, I must have paid it. So I start digging around for papers, old papers, new papers. I'm just finding something that shows. And everything I find, sure enough, my insurance expired in June 2022. I'm like, what? He's like, just give me a minute. I'm like, okay. And he's then, but before he went, he reminded me, this is a $600 ticket. I said, okay. He takes my papers and he goes back. I'm sitting there trying to rack my brain. I'm like, June, what was June like for me? And June was crazy. Like, opportunities in different places. Like, me and my family were gone. And so I'm like, yeah, I guess I can see how I missed it. But for six months? And I'm starting to hate the insurance company. Aren't they supposed to hound me on that stuff? Like, no, I'm just kidding. It's my own fault. And so he comes back, and I'm like, man, I'm so sorry. Like, I can't, I, I can't even explain myself. Yeah, like, what are, I've been driving around with all this risk in my life. Can you imagine if I got in an accident, what that would have cost me? Can you imagine if I ran into something, what that would have cost me? And I'm trying to do all the math in my head, and he's like, well, listen, listen, listen. He's like, I- I'm not going to give you the ticket. I said, oh, my goodness, thank you. He said, but I can't let you drive the car away. I said, are you sure? Like, I live around the corner. Can I park? He's like, no, you can't drive this thing right now. You've got to get your assurance up, and then you can drive it again. I said, okay. So I, I, I walk home from that place, which wasn't far, but it gave me a lot of time to think. And I started, like, calculating in my head. It's like, okay, how much is the pound going to cost for my car? It's like, probably around 200 bucks, but how much is I sa- have I saved over the last six months? And I'm like, yeah, like, I'm still, like, $450 in the green. Like, this is fantastic. <laughs> Like, I'm not saying you guys should do that, but if you're tight on cash, I'm <laughs> No, don't do that. I mean, don't do that. <laughs> okay. um, and so I go and pay it, and, like, going into the pound, getting my car, like, from the towing company and stuff and paying for it, like, I drove out of there, like, waving that ticket, feeling freedom, you know? Like, man, this has been paid. It's mine. John's believing in this moment for the first time that it's actually, like, it's actually his, Like, the thing that Christ did, his victory on the cross, means something for his life. And it means something for yours, too. You currently carry around something that is called sin in your life. It's something that has separated you from the holiness of God. God is perfect and you're not. That's that's the easy way of saying it. And because you're not perfect, you can't be in relationship with the perfect God. But that God loves you so much that he didn't just, like, bypass part of the ticket, you know, and just, like, say, hey, you're not going to pay for this part, but you still owe this. You can't get it. And you might feel that way when we talk about blessing in the world or good things. You feel like God's grace is on your life because things have been going well in a practical sense. But that pending, that pending lack is still there. That missing piece, that truth about sin in your life is still part of your life. You might be in that place right now where you're like, man, it's actually part of me. Yeah, it is. And what God did out of his great love for you is he came up with a plan to send his son. Now, Jesus, who is perfectly one with the Father. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, and they're all one. Three distinct persons, but one. I know, it's crazy. It's hard. I can't explain it to my kids. I try things like an apple or a toothpaste. It's not the same. It's like that, but it's not that. But he sends his son, and his son willingly comes. He, like, willingly actually wants to come to earth because he loves you too. Like, fully, wholly loves you. And he lives on this planet, and he has opportunity to sin just like you and me, but he doesn't sin, not once. He doesn't fall into the traps of sin no matter how much he's tempted. He doesn't, he doesn't have jealousy towards other people. He doesn't, like, talk bad or gossip. No sexual sin, no love, nothing. Like, this guy's perfect, just like you and I can't be. Think of the best person you can think of your life, and now think of someone way beyond that. Jesus is that. Jesus is perfect. And then this perfect man, an innocent man, dies in our place. And in that moment of death, more than just a physical death happened, where he was innocently murdered, and, but more than that, a spiritual thing happened. Where in that moment, he took on all the weight of sin and all the weight of shame and, and all of your sin and the bad things you've done, all the bad things I've done, he took on, onto himself. He took onto himself those things, and then, he, and then he took them to the grave as he was killed. And the beautiful thing is that we see here is just like any other man would have just stayed dead, but this man didn't. Like this wasn't just a religious leader who had great ideas. We have enough of those in the world. They're the four major religions in the world. Think of like Islam and and, and Judaism and Buddhism. Like these are like personality-driven religions in the world, but all came to an end when their person died and their ideas lived on, but that person who, who led the charge and had the philosophies and ideas That person actually dead and stayed dead. Muhammad stayed dead. Buddha stayed dead. Moses, who the Judean faith was built on, stayed dead. 
But this man, Jesus, the, the one other religious leader in the world who's built upon a person, did not stay dead. And John saw and believed that he actually physically, literally rose from the dead. The tomb was empty. The linens were there, but undisturbed. He raised through them and came back to life. If someone asks you what the good news of Jesus is, it's not just that he loved you. He said he loved you enough that he died in your place and took on all the shame and guilt and burden and everything you carry that you can't get rid of, and he paid for it for you. And the proof that he paid for it in full is that his resurrected life is a true reality, that we have eyewitnesses who saw it and saw and actually experienced. And beyond this, as we go further in the story of the time that Jesus was resurrected with his people, we see over and over and over again people physically, literally interacting with Jesus, physically touching him, He's not some sort of phantom or ghost, although he does crazy things like walk through walls. And, like, and even in this moment, when we look at like the stone is rolled away and, it's dark, and the stone has been taken away from the tomb, the stone wasn't taken away for Jesus to get out. The stone was taken away so we could get in, so that we could see the proof, so that we could celebrate a risen king, so that we could, like John, actually come to a place and believe when we see the physical truth, when we see the other things, that we can then believe in who Jesus is physically, literally resurrected for your sake, for my sake, for your family's sake. This is something people need to see. They didn't understand the scripture said he must rise from the dead and the disciples went back home. Now check this out because this is awesome. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. What? Angels in this moment, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Why are you sad? Why are you, why are you carrying this? Why are you weeping right now? This is a moment of celebration. As we talked about the moment with the church to gather together is a time of celebration to celebrate a risen king. Mary, why are you weeping? Hope is in the air. Don't you see it? Hope is in the empty tomb. Stop weeping. And she said to him, they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. Again, she's caught in this idea of the death of Jesus. Where is he now? You in your life may need to hear the angels actually speaking to you just as they spoke to Mary. The truth of the gospel speaking to you just as it speaks to her. Why are you weeping? Why are you so downtrodden? Why is there no hope in your soul? Because in this moment, it's like things have actually changed. There's a new truth you need to hold on to, one where you're not going to weep anymore. But some of us are caught still just staring at the grave and staring at the brokenness in our life, seeing no hope. Listen, there is practical, real hope in Jesus. It changes everything about you, even how you see situations. Like, the hope of Jesus causes me to sit there and look at even, like, this moment with my family and fire coming out of an oven and crazy things happening and be like, Jesus, thank you so much for loving them more than I ever could. Thank you so much for giving me such an incredible wife who was able to actually like serve and take care of my kids and do everything right. Thank you, God, that you protected our home from this fire. Like I spent the night cleaning it, but over and above, the place looks great. Cleaner than it was before the fire extinguisher went to it. <laughs> I was like, man, I hope I don't know any of these firefighters who are coming in right now because that place is a mess. There's something, there's something new here, and maybe we just need to be reminded of the hope of Jesus, and, and Mary needed that too. Now, now watch. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. She didn't recognize him. I mean, scholars have all sorts of reasons why. Maybe there's a physical beating that happened in his life that's still present in his face and in his of who he was as he's in this place. Maybe her eyes were filled with water. She's crying and weeping. And Jesus says, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? And supposing that he was the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away from you. I just want Jesus back. I just want Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Mary, he spoke into Mary's life, just her name a name that was known to her, a name that was a common moment of Jesus saying, Mary, like, I know you. Do you, like, do you feel that intimate connection just with a name? And so she turned. This was the moment. She turned in Aramaic, Rabboni, Rabboni, which means teacher. 
she knew who Jesus was as he spoke and revealed himself to her. Some of us need to have a moment with Jesus where he reveals himself to us. Can I encourage you to ask for that? Some of you might hear right now just be in a place of no hope where you're carrying on and you're wondering, man, I, I need like that power that resurrected Jesus from the dead. I need that in my life. I need the presence of Jesus in my life. I'm seeking Jesus just as Mary did. Where did he go? I need him. I need him. I need him. And you've maybe felt that before in the past. Ask Jesus to reveal himself to you today. Ask him to reveal himself in a way that you would fully understand the love he has for you. Where you'd fully understand the presence he currently even still has in your life, even where you don't believe it. Ask Jesus and invite him into the hard moments and say, Jesus, show me where you are in these. Let the truth of your resurrection bring hope today. Show me how alive you are. You know what? I don't mind um, asking you to take that risk. Asking you to ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, show yourself to me. Whether it's by like speaking something into my life that I know you're true, whether it's by the circumstance around me, whether it's by community speaking it into my life, whether it's by you just showing up in a way that I can't explain that just feels just the spirit of God in my life like I need it and I know I want it. But are you willing to just invite him in? Because some of you even might be scared as to what that means. Because if Jesus is really alive, it changes everything. Like if Jesus is truly raised from the dead, it changes everything. Like Mary's life from this moment on changes and she is then given the good news of the resurrection and the next verse you're going to see in verse 17 is that she's pulled and sent on her way. I'm just going to read it to you so this can be the piece that you take with you because I think it's so important for us to understand. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to, to my God and your God. And Mary went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. And that he said these things to her. If you've experienced Jesus in your life, if God has revealed himself to you in his mercy, do not keep that news quiet. And don't believe the lies that tell you you aren't good enough to share it. Because you might be in a place where it's like, but you don't know my past. Well, great, I have a checkered past too. But you don't know what I've done. Great, I've screwed up too. God gives you this beautiful moment of revealing himself to you in a way that he knows you'll need. And if he's revealed himself to you, he sends you. What he's done to you, he wants to do through you. He wants to reveal himself to other people through your testimony. What? Even your sin is going to bring glory to him. The sin you've done in the past that he saved you from is going to show his power over all these things that other people struggle with. And if you're not willing to share it, people will not find freedom like God wants to use you to find freedom in. Here's what I mean. If you stand here and you, you actually share something that you've struggled with. Man, I've struggled with debilitating insecurity because I people please to a degree that I fear man so bad that it stops me from doing what God asked me to do. And if I share that to you as truth in my life, something that Jesus helps me to overcome, then maybe if that's your struggle too, you can find some freedom because you see where Jesus worked in my life. You see where God revealed himself to me to change me. And that's what I want for you. I want you to have a freedom where if you've engaged with Jesus, no matter what your past is, I mean, Mary had seven demons in her at some point. Seven. Like read the gospel accounts. That's not like, no, it's just one. You know what I mean? That's like exorcism again and again and again. Seven. And Jesus gives her the most important news that has ever come to humanity. That he's alive. That he really is who he said he was. That he truly has power over sin and death. And that there's truly hope for the world. And he uses her as the first vessel to share that good news. Do not disqualify yourself because of your past. Trust that Jesus wants to redeem it and use it to his glory. Take that as a challenge. Take that as hope. But take it as truth. Because Jesus sends Mary, after she recognizes who he is, as teacher. And it changes her forever. And I hope the good news of Jesus changes you too. Let's pray into that together. Jesus, we thank you so much. 
that in the midst of a broken and hard time in our lives, things we walk through, things we see, things we experience, things that may cause us to have a great deal of discouragement, Jesus, that your resurrection is true, that you truly did physically, literally raise from the dead. That all the things that you took with you couldn't hold you because you paid them in full. That we can trust the goodness of your great love for us and that great love can transform us, that meeting with you can change who we are. So God, I do pray and ask that today you would meet with those who need to see you. You would reveal yourself to those who don't know you. You would show yourself to be true and alive to those who need to know the hope in real and practical ways. And for those of us who love you, Jesus, the same prayer. Keep revealing yourselves to us. Keep showing us who you are. Keep giving us greater depths of understanding into your great love for us. Let it never get old. And help us every week, every day, every minute, every moment to be reminded of the good news of a king who rose victorious over death and sin and Satan and shame and one who brings truth and light so that we ourselves will be changed forever. But we bring that truth to people who desperately need that hope. We pray all this, Jesus, in your powerful and beautiful name and celebrate you for it. Amen. Amen. Amen.